Good morning. Welcome to our virtual worship service here at Bell United Methodist Church. I'm Jeff Ball with the clergy here, and I'm so glad you are joining us today. If you would like to put any prayer concerns or questions or comments in the chat, please do so. We will monitor that and get, get to it as we are able. Um, we are, uh, of course, uh, meeting in person at 8.30 in the, fellowship, in the sanctuary and at 11 in the fellowship hall. If you have any other questions, if you want a bulletin, for instance, or information about the church, go to bit.ly slash info. And now let us turn our hearts to worship, Almighty God. Good morning. I am Kim Sheard. Please join as we continue our Lenten journey. The congregational responses are in bold. We continue our movement through the Lent season this week with another kind of letting go. This week we lament that so much in life is out of our control. This is frustrating to us and so sometimes we have been tempted to believe the sayings that tell us if we just think positively, we can turn it all around. Yet our experience tells us that this doesn't always work. Let us turn ladder climbing toward the expectation of a perfect life into garden tending, nurturing what is, and embracing our holy, good enough lives. Let us pray together. Holy One, our light and salvation, we call out to you, sometimes afraid of the adversaries in life. Shelter us in days of trouble. Lead us on level paths. Open us this day to your grace and peace. Transform our frustrations into simple and good enough moments that fill our days. Amen. Oh, mm -hmm. 
Even Jesus got dang frustrated when folks didn't behave as he would have liked. We probably aren't receiving death threats from Herod as Jesus was, but our well-being could be threatened by the idea that if we just try hard enough, are nice enough, say just the right thing, life will always go our way. We run around in so many directions, trying to herd the chicks into some imagined semblance of perfect formation. Have you ever tried to herd chicks? What if we could let go of needing all things and all people to be just so, and instead learn to dance with the unfolding of that which is not ours to control? Let us take a moment of silent reflection. Hear this compassionate word from the psalmist. I believe that I shall see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord, be strong, and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. Know that already God is offering us freedom from feeling alone in fixing what feels oh so wrong with this world, inviting us to let go of the need to be God so that we might recognize that God is with us, offering courage in difficulty. And now that despite our sometimes faltering steps, in the name of Jesus Christ, we are being forgiven, even now. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. The scripture reading this week is from the book of Luke, chapter 13, verses 31 through 35. At that very hour, some Pharisees came and said to him, Get away from here, for Herod wants to kill you. He said to them, go and tell that fox for me. Listen, I am casting out demons and performing cures today and tomorrow. And on the third day, I finish my work. Yet today, tomorrow, and the next day, I must be on my way because it is impossible for a prophet to be killed outside of Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often have I desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. See, your house is left to you. And I tell you, you will not see me until the time comes when you say, Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In my family, we play a lot of games. We especially like card games. And when you're playing cards, as game theorists will tell you, you have imperfect knowledge. You, you don't know what's in the other hands. And you have to make decisions based on that imperfect knowledge. Now, you can spend a lot of time, and sometimes we do, we spend a lot of time thinking, oh, what are the options? What are the, you know, da, 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 da. But at some point, you've got to make the decision and go forward. And once you've made that decision, that's it. Right or wrong, good or bad, go and finish the game. I think Jesus would understand this. Because I think that's what's happened until he, in this story. Will you pray with me? And now, O oh Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. My rock and my reading. You see, Jesus was going about his ministry, doing what God had called him to do. Healing, teaching, proclaiming good news. Release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, all that wonderful stuff. But here, some Pharisees come to him with a warning. Now, in the Gospels, the Pharisees are not seen as Jesus' friends. Now, there are some ex no notable exceptions, but they are usually named. When we see the Pharisees, that's usually a, a chance for us to go, boo, his. They're often the bad guys. That's not always 
the right approach, but that's often how they're portrayed. So when we see the Pharisees or some Pharisees come to Jesus and give him a warning, on the surface, it seems like they're being friendly to him. But I'm not sure that's the case here. I could be wrong, but I don't, I'm not sure that's the case. And I don't think Jesus sees it that way. Because he says, he says, oh, you go tell that fox. You tell Herod. If you're in communication with Herod, I know it, and I know what you're trying to do here. So, so just go back to him and tell him, no way, not happening. I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing. I'm casting out demons and curing performing cures today and tomorrow and not until the third day will I finish my work. Now, he did not mean that literally. He wasn't done in three days. But certainly that gives us some thought toward the resurrection. Another story, another sermon. Basically, Jesus is saying, I'm not worried about you. You've got nothing here. I'm going to go keep doing what I'm supposed to be doing. Now, I'm sure, I'm sure that Jesus was hurt by this. Not, not just what was said, said but, but by the fact that the people were not receiving his message as they should have. He wants to claim good news. He wants people to receive that and, and receive the kingdom of God, to understand the forgiveness of God and the presence of God in their lives. And they did. And that's got to hurt. And now he gets this warning from Herod. And, and remember, Herod, Herod, Herod was technically not a king. They, they have called him that, but he was not a king. He was just a tetrarch in a you know, backward country in, 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 on the outskirts of this larger Roman Empire. But Herod had a lot of authority, and if he wanted somebody dead, then he could make it happen. Again, his, his commitment, to, Rome just cared about him keeping the peace and raising the taxes. And Herod was pretty good at that. And if somebody had to die along the way, well, you know, that's just business. So this was not an idle threat. And Jesus could have taken it very seriously. But he didn't. He didn't quit. He didn't, he didn't pull back on what he was doing. He kept doing what he was doing. See, he, he knew that these foxes were not as clever as they thought they were. That's usually the case. And instead of quitting, he just kept going, proclaiming God's love for everybody. But it hurt him. And, he, and here, when he, he looks over at Jerusalem, he weeps. Because they are, are not making the good choices they need to make. He wants to protect them like a, a mother hen. Keeping them away from foxes. Clearly, a metaphor there. You know, that's what mother hens do. They, they try to protect their chicks. The chicks want to run all over the place. It's hard work to gather them in, and, and I'm sure he felt it was hard work. But you know, there have been several examples known of, of, of fires that have swept through barnyards, and, and they have found the body of the, of the mother hen with her, her wings, arms wrapped around her chicks. Keeping them, trying to keep them safe. And I think that's how Jesus felt, like that mother hen. But he didn't quit. He didn't stop. When, when seeing, you know, things may have seemed out of control, they're not going the way I think they should. What do you do? Jesus didn't stop. Maybe we shouldn't either. And yet, we, 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 we see problems and, and concerns, and, and we let them overtake us. We should not let circumstances control us. A wonderful uh, fable about a young lion and a cougar, and they're both thirsty, and they arrive in a watering hole at the same time. They begin to look at each other and, and stare at each other, challenge each other to, to, to see who gets to go first. And they both get their haunches up. And they both decide that I'm not going to let this other one go first. They begin to pace and stare and circle. 
But after a little bit, they noticed there were some vultures flying around the boat. And they both realized, those vultures don't care who gets the first drink of water. They're waiting for us to fight and, and one of us to die so they can feast. And they realize, that's not worth it. So they both turn and walk away. Rather than get caught up in things that he cannot control. Tom Berlin, Pastor over at Flores, uh, posted a video, and I, I put it on Facebook. I hope, if you haven't had a chance to see it, I hope you, you will, because he's talking about our postponement of general conference. And that is our quadrennial every four years they, general conference meets to, to set the, the direction, the, the, the book of discipline, our, our rule book for the Holy United Methodist Church. And, and the 2020 general conference was not able to meet. And it's been postponed and Again, postpone one more time. It won't happen for another two years. There are a lot of things that, that, that Tom says, and I, I agree with him, that, that, that we, we, we want to happen there. We're not happy that it's being postponed. But it's not in our control. And, and there, there, are, there are understandable reasons why it's being postponed. But Tom reminds us very well that, okay, that's over here. We can't do anything about it, so we let it go and focus on what we're called to do. And, and Tom's engaged with General Conference. He's not, he's not washing it away, but he's like, I can't change that. I can't fix that. I'm not going to dwell on it. I'm going to keep doing what we're supposed to be doing. That's the role of the church. In spite of the circumstances, in spite of the threats and the problems, Keep doing what we're called to do. I think we've done a decent job of that at Vail. We, we continue. We've had our Christmas tree sale. We, we, our Neighbors Feeding Neighbors has, has continued. We, we, I, hope, I hope you saw the, 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 the food that was collected just last week. Our other ministries and programs, our fellowship. COVID hasn't shut us down. We haven't let those circumstances control us. We've adapted to them, but kept doing what God is calling us to do. This sermon series is based on a, on a book of devotions called Good Enough. And in that, they, uh, the authors tell a story of Adeline. She was the accompanist, church pianist, for a long time. And her husband, in many years, passed. It was hard and sad. But the next Sunday, there she was in church, ready to play and accompany the music of the worship service. And they asked her why. She said, well, I'm on the schedule. It was my, my Sunday at work. You know, she, she, she had a focus. She mourned her husband. But, but, but while mourning her husband, she could still keep going. She wasn't going to let those circumstances control her. Lent is a time for us to think about those things. I'm, I'm sure you've heard the example. Our, our, our youth last week uh, actually did it. They, they took a jar, and they had, they, had a, they had a collection of big rocks and a collection of, of smaller rocks, and I hope you know how this works. You know, you put the small rocks in first, you don't have room for the big ones. You gotta put the big ones in first. And the small ones will fit around it. Great. Less object lesson on priority. But the other piece of that that we often forget is you've got to choose what rocks go in because you only have so much space. You cannot do it all. Hope in this Lent season, we will think about that. Maybe step back and say, you know what? I don't have time to do this. It's taking up a lot of my time, and, and it's not that important to me, so I'm going to take it out and not put it in the jar. And make decisions and go forward. Now, you might realize that, you know, that was the wrong decision. I, I actually need to do that. Or maybe, you know what, 
I can't do that big rock. I'm going to do half of that big rock. What are your priorities? What can you do with what you have in front of you? That's all God is asking us to do. I, I, I mentioned playing cards and, and having imperfect knowledge. We often play spades, and, and, and that's uh, two teams of two each. So, 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 so Kim is often my partner, and I don't know what's in her hand. But when you play spades, you, you look at your hand, and, and, you, and you make a bid. You say, you know what, I think I can take this many tricks. And your partner says the same thing, and together you have to take that total amount of tricks. If you take extra, it's okay. If you don't take as many as you should, as you said you would, then, then, then there's a penalty. Like bridge, if you ever play bridge. Less complicated than bridge. There's, a, there's another trick, though, in spades that I really like. It's called nil. And you say, I'm not going to take any tricks. You can't make me take a trick. And of course, that's worth a lot of points. And, and so the other team will try real hard to make you take a trick. Well, we were playing one time, and I had four spades, which are trump. And it's, it's, hard, it's hard to not take a trick when you have four spades because everybody else may only have three and you've got an extra one that's going to take a trick because it always, the Trump always wins. Higher Trump will take it, but as we were playing, I realized I had miscounted. I actually had five spades. And I was like, uh-oh. Well, as we're getting toward, toward the end, my, my daughter is thinking, you know what? She knew, she saw me play the four spades. She said, well, you know what? He would never been nil on five spades. So she played as if I did not have that fifth spade. And that allowed me to actually make my nil. It worked. But let's back that up a little bit. See, as, 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 as we talk about cards, I think there are good decisions and bad decisions. There are right decisions and wrong decisions. A good decision does not always is not always the right decision for the outcome you want, and a bad decision is not always the right outcome for the or the outcome for the wrong thing to happen. I made a bad decision. I should not have been nil with five spades. My daughter made a good decision. Oh, you would never be nil with five spades. But that's what happened. So my bad decision turned into the right decision because I made my nail. Her good decision, based on good information, was the wrong decision because she didn't set my nail. Just a card game. But how much of your life is that way? Are you regretting bad decisions? If so, think about why you made those bad decisions. I didn't count my cars like I should have. I missed one. Be more careful in the future. My, my daughter will think next time, hmm, he might have five spades. It's kind of a family joke now. But hopefully I've learned from that. And sometimes you make a good decision that doesn't turn out the way you thought it would. You know what? It's okay. Go on. See, God does not expect us to be perfect. God expects us to be good enough. And not let the things that are beyond our control control us and hold us back and keep us from going forward and doing the wonderful work that God has laid out for us. So let it go. You know, if you're if you're all wrapped around the axle about what's going on in the world and, and don't know what to do, then maybe you need to give yourself a little break. Stop watching so much news or or, 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 or web surfing, however it is you get that information. Maybe, maybe do something positive in that direction. I I, I made a contribution to Umcor this week to help our Ukrainian friends. It was hurt by this disaster. Maybe you can find some way to do something productive. 
to go out and, 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 and volunteer with some of the projects that we have going on here at Vail. Maybe just pick up the phone and call a friend and talking to them or sending them an email or writing a letter. But don't let those things that you can't control control you. Because God is with you. God has called you. And God wants to do great things through you. You don't have to be perfect. You're already good enough. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord, speak to us. For we, your servants, are listening. Sanctification, or the process of being set apart or made holy, is a theological concept that has been greatly debated over time. Are we made holy in a once and done kind of way? Or are we simply moving in that direction based on our merits? It is as if once the debate is settled, then we can know what to do and control the outcome of goodness for ourselves. And yet, if we worry less about our own sanctification and more on treating the world, the planet, and all the creatures, especially those who are suffering, as holy and worthy of our love, then we will be acting on what we can control sharing what we have with others. Our response this morning is when you hear me say, O oh Lord, hear our prayer, your response is, and hold us in your hand. Let us pray together. O oh God, we are so tired. Each breath is shallow, strength has melted away, and hope is hidden behind a wall. Some days it's hard to even crawl out of bed. Isolated in our constant movement, we feel bombarded, bombarded with the endless to-dos, images of unjust war in Ukraine, fighting with neighbors, friends, and family over politics, the juggling too much, being spread too thin, the attempt to buy our way to salvation. O Lord, hear our prayer and hold us in your hand. O God, a cry goes out to you from the ends of the earth. Show us again how you bring dry bones to life. 
May we see and respond to the needs of the people around us as life is breathed into the unity of community. O Lord, hear our prayer and hold us in your hand. Blessed are we, the weary and weak and sore, with only the merest ember left burning, but who still say, Breathe on me, breath of God. Breathe life into tired bodies, heavy limbs. Bring light to the dark corners. Breathe comfort into sad hearts. May the light illumine so we may see that we are not alone in the dark. May comfort come as we care for one another. O Lord, hear our prayer and hold us in your hand. Blessed are those who suffer from illness, grief, depression. Blessed are those who strive for peace in the midst of violence. Blessed are those who are oppressed, displaced, despised. May we see with your eyes beyond our own stories toward a community that wraps around one another in love and acceptance, even in our diversity. O oh Lord, hear our prayer and hold us in your hand. Blessed Lord, thank you for your presence when all else fades away. Lead us ever forward as we give who, who we are in the ways that we can, safe in the knowledge that we are good enough. All these things we pray in the name of the Christ who taught us to pray together saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
week, last Sunday, we had a, a marshmallow uh, roast. It was a lot of fun. A lot of folks participated and really enjoyed it. We had some wonderful music by the, uh, our friends with the Oakland Jam. We also collected quite a bit of food to go to the, uh, the food pantry. And um, again, thank you for that, for all that you contribute and give. Give and let us give God. God thanks for those blessings. Generous God, in light of your extravagant blessings, no matter what the state of the world or of our imperfect lives, we offer our gifts, we offer ourselves, and we know that you transform what we plant into the produce of love. Where struggle is everyone's normal. You walk among the fellowship of the afflicted, a club no one wants to join. And while this isn't shiny, it does come with superpowers. Superpowers of ever-widening empathy and existential courage that get you back up after another fall, and it deepen all of the beauty and love that can be found in, amid life's struggle. Like flowers that grow back from the cracks in the sidewalk, these virtues blossom in you. And thank God for you. Less of all of us who struggle, for we are in good company and will never walk alone. And now, may the God who loves all of creation, especially when it's painful, and Jesus, our companion along this crooked path called life, and the Holy Spirit who loves to improvise in surprising ways, go with you, dwell with you, and give you joy. Amen.